Hello everybody, so this is a talk on multiple myeloma. And uh, so multiple myeloma is another uh, leukemia sort of disease, uh, except for that this is not a disease that expels a whole lot of uh, cells into the peripheral circulation. So this is primarily a disease in the bone marrow and multiple myeloma affects the plasma cells, the mature plasma cells. And what it is, is it's a clonal proliferation of plasma cells, most commonly plasma cells that secrete IgG. But it's not necessary that they secrete IgG, they can also secrete other antibodies. But it's a clonal proliferation of plasma cells. So they all secrete the same antibody. And that's going to be something that's really important when it comes to detecting multiple myeloma in some of the tests that that are done. Uh, multiple myeloma is part of a spectrum of disorders. So uh, multiple myeloma is always by definition symptomatic. However, there are also uh, other diseases that sort of exist on the multiple myeloma spectrum that while they're not necessarily symptomatic, the fact that a patient has it carries with it a risk of multiple myeloma and uh, some of the laboratories that we see are characteristic of what we see also in multiple myeloma. So these include monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance where a patient does indeed have a uh, a spike in a certain protein created by a clonal proliferation of plasma cells, and then also smoldering myeloma, where indeed the patient does have a bone marrow, uh, uh, a bone marrow biopsy that's indicative of multiple myeloma. However, in both uh, multi or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and smoldering myeloma, what's most important is that the patient doesn't have symptoms of multiple myeloma. Myeloma. They don't have signs of end organ damage that come with multiple myeloma, and therefore they are definitively not multiple myeloma. So by definition, multiple myeloma is always symptomatic, and we'll talk about what those symptoms are. They're very, uh, very obvious symptoms. Approximately 20,000 cases occur in the U.S. per year. The median age of onset is uh, towards the end of the seventh decade of life. It's around 70 years old, and the ratio of blacks to whites is 2 to 1. The chief symptoms include bone pain, and around 70% of patients that present with multiple myeloma will have this uh, This symptom. So uh, this can be bone pain that's frank or it can be bone pain that's uh, noted on palpation uh, of the bone. You can have pathologic fractures and the bone pain and fractures are simply just due to a weakness of the bone and that's caused from the, the proliferation of the bone marrow uh, and uh, also due to the fact that uh, multiple myeloma cells, the, the plasma cells in multiple my, myeloma secrete something called osteoclast activating factor, and that also reduces the integrity of the bone. So both of those things cause bone pain and fractures. Neuropathy can happen as a result from multiple myeloma as well, and that's neuropathy that's due to uh, to bone collapse. So that could be uh, something like carpal tunnel syndrome. You can also get uh, you can also get entrapment of uh, of the nerves coming out of, uh, of out of the vert vertebra. So uh, that's neuropathy secondary to bone disease. Pallor and fatigue are secondary to anemia. Most, if not all, patients with multiple myeloma have a normocytic anemia, uh, and then ecchymoses uh, can uh, present as well. So something that's important to remember, as I mentioned, uh, but I need to stress again, unlike most hematologic malignancies, multiple myeloma is not diagnosed simply based on biopsy. The diagnosis is clinical. So bone marrow biopsy, while it's an integral part of how we diagnose multiple myeloma, it is not, you, you can't look at a bone marrow biopsy and definitively say, this is a patient with multiple myeloma. The bone marrow biopsy is a component, but it is not the ultimate diagnosis. This is a clinical diagnosis. 
Okay, so 70% of patients with multiple myeloma are actually going to present complaining of bone pain or giving bone pain or bony tenderness in their history. So as mentioned, being, being uh, that this is the most common symptom, this is something that you really should associate with multiple myeloma, is that these patients have bone pain or bony tenderness. And the reason that this happens is not just because of the bone marrow proliferating, but because of the fact that these disordered cells in multiple myeloma are secreting a, uh, a protein that's activating osteoclasts. And so it is actually lysing the bone. Uh, other common presentations with multiple myeloma include the pathologic fracture due to the decreased integrity of the bone, uh, spinal cord compression or uh, compression of, of uh, spinal nerves, fatigue and malaise due to anemia, and uh, neuropathy secondary to uh, nerve compression. You may also see uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a high association with carpal, uh, with carpal tunnel syndrome. A minority of patients will have symptoms of amyloidosis, and that amyloidosis is due to light chain deposition. Light chains being created by the B cells, of course. And signs of amyloidosis in patients with MM are going to be uh, enlargement, swelling of the shoulder joints, subcutaneous nodules, and uh, macroglossia. So the mnemonic, and this is going to be a really good mnemonic to remember for MM because this gives you the cardinal symptoms that you see with, uh, with, with uh, end-stage organ failure uh, that's going to help you differentiate multiple myeloma from MGUS and from smoldering myeloma is CRAB. So CRAB are a set of signs and symptoms that you see in, uh, in multiple myeloma and that includes hypercalcemia. So that could be symptomatic or asymptomatic hypercalcemia. Uh, and that, of course, would be seen on labs, but if the patient has symptomatic hypercalcemia, we would expect to see uh, fatigue, lethargy, uh, uh, and uh, decreased tendon reflexes, and so forth. Renal failure, uh, which, again, this can be uh, fatigue-like symptoms, uremia, but we would uh, expect to see a, uh, an increased creatinine and a BUN creatinine ratio of less than 20 to 1. And this is going to be uh, a, a uh, intrinsic renal failure. It's not going to be a post-renal. Uh, anemia is generally seen uh, secondary to the fact that we've got a proliferation of plasma cells in the uh, bone marrow, but it's also uh, it's also due to the fact that uh, you have a chronic disease going on here, and then bone pain uh, occurs because of the osteolysis and because of the uh, proliferation of the bone marrow. So C R A B, and it's important again to remember these uh, symptoms because these are the symptoms that are really going to help you determine multiple myeloma. From, uh, from smoldering myeloma and, uh, and MGUS. So uh, for diagnosis, uh, as mentioned, bone marrow biopsy is going to be the most helpful single test as far as laboratory tests. However, uh, there are multiple tests that need to be performed in order to make the definitive diagnosis of multiple myeloma in order to, uh, in order to really work the patient up fully. So bone marrow biopsy is the most accurate test, but there are other tests that are needed for the workup. So let's talk about what those tests are. For routine labs, uh, of course, CBC and CMP are going to be things that we'll always have in any patient that presents with uh, significant symptoms. The CBC should, so, should show a normocytic anemia, uh, and, and that's just because of a, a, a decreased production of red blood cells. Uh, and because you uh, have a chronic disease going on here. The CMP often will show a hypercalcemia. If you get a PTH, which generally you do in any patient that has a hypercalcemia, it should be a suppressed PTH. This isn't hyperparathyroidism going on. This is hypercalcemia due to increased bone turnover. You should also see uremia uh, on your uh, CMP, and you would have a BUN to creatinine ratio that should be less than 20 to 1. 
a peripheral smear in multiple myeloma. And this is important to remember because the USMLE likes to throw this out there. If you get a peripheral smear, uh, a lot of times you're going to see red blood cells that are attached together in these chains. And what this is, is it's called a rouleau. And this rouleau is just red blood cells that are attached together uh, by these uh, by the light chains that are secreted into the serum. And so you get these uh, like um, these like chains of red blood cells. I'll show you what they look like. You'll, you'll remember you'll remember them. On your analysis, that may be positive for proteins. If it is, that's highly associated with multiple myeloma as opposed to MGUS and smoldering myeloma. Uh, the year analysis should include testing for Bentz Jones protein. Uh, a standard year analysis may not show uh, Bentz Jones protein. Uh, so when you're getting a year analysis in a patient you're working up for multiple myeloma, you should uh, indicate that you want a test done for Bentz Jones protein. The ESR should be elevated, and a skeletal survey should be done in any patient where you suspect multiple myeloma because you're looking for uh, lytic bone lesions, and those will be also positive uh, in multiple myeloma very frequently, and you should see them particularly in the ribs, in the skull, and in the uh, proximal humerus, hip, and proximal femur. Uh, what you see is sort of this soap bubble appearance, and I've got some pictures of those that I'll show you. There's also serum protein electrophoresis, or SPEP, and urine protein electrophoresis, or UPEP. Uh, those will show a variously high M protein level, and the M protein is what's secreted by these plasma cells. A bone marrow biopsy is the most accurate test and a very necessary test for diagnosing multiple myeloma. And always in multiple myeloma, you will have greater than 10% plasma cells on the biopsy. So remember that I told you you don't need to remember, you don't need to look at pathologic slides or biopsies on step two and three, but I do want to show you what these rouleaus look like so you have this in your mind that they, they are associated with multiple myeloma. And you can see here these red blood cells are attached in these chains. You've got a lot of them here. So here you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, twelve, twelve red blood cells attached in a chain. And this is something that's very commonly seen in, uh, in multiple myeloma. Here you have lytic lesions, this sort of soap bubble appearance in the skull, and also uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the humerus, and then also in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the distal forearm. Here you can also see it uh, to a degree in the femur and in the hips. So these, this soap bubble appearance, or it can be sometimes described as a salt and pepper appearance if the, the lytic lesions are smaller, this is also characteristic of multiple myeloma. And then here's a pathologic fracture of the humerus and a pathologic fracture of the femur. And uh, this is definitely something that will point you towards multiple myeloma. Pathologic fractures, uh, as opposed to regular fractures, a pathologic fracture, by definition, is a fracture that occurs via uh, trauma that's insignificant. So this isn't a patient that got into a car accident. This is a patient that maybe fell out of bed. When you fall out of bed, you shouldn't have a full-on fracture of the, of the, the humerus. Uh, I mean, if the patient has a, a history of severe osteoporosis, they might get a uh, fracture of, of the femur here. But you definitely should never get a fracture of the humerus like this with uh, just coincidental trauma. So that's a pathologic fracture, and that's something that points you towards multiple myeloma. Again, these are symptoms of multiple myeloma. And remember, with multiple myeloma, you have to have symptoms. That's what differentiates it from MGUS and smoldering myeloma. So the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma. So here's the crescendo. Remember, you have to diagnose multiple myeloma clinically. Just having that bone marrow biopsy or that monoclonal spike on SPEP or UPEP, that's not enough to diagnose multiple myeloma. You have to have the clinical signs as well. So 
the most important ones that I told you, again, fall under that crab mnemonic. So the end organ symptoms, including hypercalcemia, which is due to bone lysis, renal failure, which is due to the Benz-Jones protein, anemia, and bone lesions. Uh, and then you also have to have a monoclonal protein, also known as M protein, uh, spike on SPEP or UPEP. And then you also have to have greater than 10% plasma cells on bone marrow biopsy. All of these criteria must be satisfied in order to make the definitive diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So comparing multiple myeloma to MGUS and smoldering myeloma, as mentioned, multiple myeloma, you have to have the M, M spike, uh, and that's on serum protein electrophoresis, but you'll also have the M spike on urine protein electrophoresis. You have to have the CRAB clinical signs, and you have to have greater than 10% plasma cells on uh, bone marrow biopsy. Now the difference between uh, multiple myeloma and MGUS is that in MGUS, uh, there's two things. You, like multiple myeloma, you do have an M spike. Uh, so remember, MGUS is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. You do have this unusual spike of, of these monoclonal proteins. However, you don't have symptoms of multiple myeloma, and you don't have the plasma cell proliferation that you would see in multiple myeloma. So Basically, in MGUS, all you have is just this M spike on your serum protein electrophoresis. So you really don't know what that means. So the, what, the, how we go ahead and treat MGUS is just by watching and waiting. And we do know that patients with MGUS do have an increased risk for transitioning into multiple myeloma. Approximately 1-2% to 2 per year of patients that satisfy the criteria of MGUS, which is simply having an M spike on serum protein electrophoresis, uh, about 1-2% to 2 of these patients per year will go into multiple myeloma. With smoldering myeloma, the only thing that makes this different from multiple myeloma is the fact that they don't have the crab symptoms. So they've got the M spike and you do bone marrow biopsy and they've got 10% or more, or, or more uh, plasma cells, but they don't have the hypercalcemia or the renal disease or the anemia or the bone lesions. Uh, so these patients with smoldering myeloma, they have a slightly higher risk than MGUS of transitioning to multiple myeloma but we still just watch and wait with these patients. We don't necessarily want to jump right in to, uh, to treating these patients with a bone marrow transplant and chemotherapy because that's a, a very uh, significant treatment protocol that we're gonna go through and not all of these patients will wind up going into multiple myeloma. So it is greater than 2% per year. However, we can, because of the fact that there are new and emerging therapies for multiple myeloma and smoldering myeloma, you can consider referring these patients to a study group, but that's not going to be on the test. So unless the patient has symptoms, which they don't in MGUS or smoldering myeloma, the treatment is to watch and wait. Now with multiple myeloma, they satisfy all of the criteria for multiple myeloma. They have the M spike not only in their serum, but also in their urine. They have the crab signs, and they have greater than 10% plasma cells on biopsy. And with these patients, we're going to do chemotherapy and uh, autologous bone marrow transplant. And whether we do the bone marrow transplant is going to be based on whether the patient is eligible for bone marrow transplant. So how do we know if the patient is eligible for bone marrow transplant? Well, first off, this is an autologous bone marrow transplant, so we're taking the patient's own cells and transfusing them back into the patient. So first, how do we know if they're a candidate? There are a lot of different things that an oncologist can take into perspective uh, as far as whether they decide a patient is a candidate for bone marrow transplant. For the USMLE, what you need to know is that if a patient's greater than 70 uh, or they have serious comorbidities, 
that generally means they're not candidates for bone marrow transplant. And the reason is because the preparation for the bone marrow transplant, which is a, a hefty dose of chemotherapeutic drugs, uh, generally that's going to be more uh, problematic for the patient than uh, to let them go on with the multiple myeloma and, and to treat them symptomatically. So if it's a younger patient with few comorbidities, that's bone marrow transplant eligible. If it's an older patient with more comorbidities, then they're bone marrow transplant ineligible. So if the patient is bone marrow transplant eligible, then what we first need to do uh, after we get the stem cells that we're going to transfuse them with, what we need to do is basically kill off all the bone marrow. And the way we're going to do that is with uh, a, uh, a cocktail of chemotherapeutics that includes vincristine, adriamycin, and dexamethasone. And you could add cyclophosphamide to this. So this is the VAD or CVAD preparation. After you've had them on that for X amount of time, I don't really know how long it is, it's not important for the USMLE, this isn't an oncology test, you just know you gotta prepare them. Uh, after you've done that, then you give them the bone marrow transplant, and after they've gotten the bone marrow transplant, they're gonna be on long-term therapy with thalidomide or melphalan. If the patient is bone marrow transplant ineligible, so older patients, sicker patients, then they're going to be on long-term therapy with melphalan and prednisone. You could also use dexamethasone if you want, um, but melphalan and a corticosteroid. During the course of their multiple myeloma, you're going to also treat any kind of symptomatic hypercalcemia as you <coughs> excuse me, normally would, and you do that with hydration and loop diuretics, furosemide, and if that's not enough to uh, successfully treat their symptomatic hypercalcemia, which remember is uh, just basically a nervous system depression, uh, then you're going to use second line uh, bisphosphonates. So that would be something like pemhydronate or a bisphosphonate that's injectable. So some final notes, uh, the therapy for multiple myeloma as of uh, as of this recording in 2013 is rapidly changing. There are a lot of new drugs, including a new class of drugs called proteasome inhibitors. Uh, the first of which uh, that came out is bortezomib. Uh, so there are a lot of drugs that could be used and a lot of them have been just recently approved. Really the USMLE step two and three expects you to have just a basic knowledge of treating and diagnosing multiple myeloma. So what you should really know is the difference between MGUS and multiple myeloma and that autologous bone marrow therapy or bone marrow transplant is the most effective therapy for symptomatic multiple myeloma. Any knowledge beyond that is going to help you break into that 95th percentile. Um, but uh, what what you've got in this uh, in, in these set of slides will be more than enough to help you know how to treat a patient uh, with multiple myeloma or MGUS or smoldering myeloma on the wards and on the test. Knowledge beyond that is going to be uh, is going to be specialized for oncologists to deal with, um, and that's pretty much it.